Bona tarda a tothom i benvinguts a aquest cicle de converses La Pedrera. Abans de res, agrair-vos que estigueu aquí. Sabem que hi ha una agenda molt suculenta aquesta setmana, aquests dies, així que us agraïm moltíssim que hagueu triat aquesta sessió on hem convidat l'Eugeni Morozov. Bona tarda, gràcies per venir. Bé, abans de començar a fer-li les preguntes directament, ens agradaria compartir amb vosaltres algunes notes biogràfiques de l'Eugeni, perquè creiem que us ajudaran a entendre una miqueta més el seu pensament. Hi ha coses que traspuen quan se'l llegeix i m'agradaria rescatar-ne algunes. En primer lloc, ell neix el 1984 al vell mig de Minsk, una ciutat que es diu Soligorsk, que és una mena de colònia creada al voltant de l'activitat minera, al voltant d'una mina, i que va treure molta mà d'obra russa i ucraïna i els seus pares eren una miqueta d'aquest origen. I ell neix i creix en un entorn on el tema dels mitjans de comunicació està molt mediat. És a dir, neix el que és Bielorússia, però hi ha moltíssima influència russa, els mitjans de comunicació són russos, la televisió és russa... Vaig llegir en una entrevista que li feien que això va passar fins que Lukashenko puja al poder i ell tenia 10 anys. Per tant, a l'adolescència és quan Bielorússia comença a controlar els seus mitjans de comunicació i deixa d'estar tan lligat al que era Moscou en aquell moment. Després, ell surt d'allà i va estudiar a Bulgària, en escoles que tenen finançament d'Estats Units, té tot un trajecte intel·lectual fantàstic, estudia, entre altres coses, administració d'empreses i economia, però de tots els autors que probablement han llegit, que segur que són moltíssims, m'agradaria citar els que ell recorda de la seva estada al European College of Liberal, que eren Freud, Marx i Foucault. Destaco aquests tres perquè són, diguéssim, tres pilars, diria que fonamentals, dels llibres que ell després produirà i escriurà. Donat que estem aquí per parlar de les bondats i les perversions del Big Data, de les dades de Big Data, també m'agradaria rescatar en quin moment comença el seu interès per les tecnologies, i sobretot per aquest ús de les tecnologies com a instrument humà. I la veritat és que la primera tribuna que ell escriu sobre tecnologia i política és el 2003, una tribuna que es deia Cosmopolit, amb K. Després, gràcies a això, salta a treballar amb una ONG que està orientada a la formació de periodistes, a una revista que s'anomenava Transitions Online, que també té finançament internacional. Després és becari de la Fundació Open Society i es muda a Nova York. I allà el projecte que ell desenvolupa durant aquesta beca és el primer llibre que és The Net Delusion, The Dark Side of Internet Freedom, que és la primera vegada que ell parla de com de decepcionant és un sistema que havia de ser llibertat absoluta com és Internet i resulta que té una cara molt fosca que ell ja vaticinava o ja explicava el 2011, però ara que estem al 2018 i especialment en els 3-4 últims anys estem veient que va ser un dels primers en parlar d'això, però que ara no deixem de parlar-ne i per això també l'hem convidat. Va escriure també més tard, un parell d'anys més tard, el llibre de Per guardar-ho tot, clica aquí, on parlava d'un concepte molt divertit que ara li preguntarem sobre el solucionisme tecnològic i esperem que ens expliqui alguna cosa més sobre això. I actualment el podeu llegir a Twitter, malgrat parli d'això, té un Twitter, el fa servir, és molt actiu, i on normalment retuiteja continguts vinculats a això, però sobretot els seus articles de The Guardian, de The Economist i totes les traduccions, per exemple, entre elles, a El País o Corriere de la Sera o el Frankfurter Allgemeine de Zeitung. I per part meva diria que ja està, perquè heu vingut a sentir-lo a ell i no pas a mi. Espero que aquestes pinzellades ens ajudin a situar-lo una miqueta més. I sense més preàmbuls, ara ja sí que, Eugeni, m'agradaria començar la conversa amb tu. I, com dèiem, ens agradaria que ens expliquessis una mica més què hi ha darrere d'aquest concepte del tecnosolucionisme, perquè és una mena de mite que inunda les nostres vides i una mica inclús la nostra relació amb la tecnologia i amb les dades, i què ens diries, què ens descobriries d'aquesta màgia que hi ha al voltant de la tecnologia? Well, thank you very much for this introduction and thank you very much for coming. Um, well, speaking of solutionism, it was uh, a concept that I think when I first introduced it in the public discourse about 
five years ago, it was a nice way to capture um, a certain fetish, a certain uh, fascination that uh, a lot of policymakers, but also entrepreneurs, and especially entrepreneurs, had was trying to reframe uh, every political issue, every political debate, uh, from you know climate change to unemployment to any problem you can imagine as something that can be resolved not just by technology, but technology in the hands of this few big American firms. So essentially, every single ideological issue, you know, the debates we've been having about healthcare, transportation, education, you know, you, you have it, suddenly became an issue to be addressed by a new set of players. And you can say that those players were hackers, you know, technologists, um, entrepreneurs. Uh, very often, they were also representatives of big business because even a company like Facebook, which is a multi-billion firm with uh, a lot of revenue, if, even if very few taxes paid, at least in Europe, they like still to wear this mantle, this costume of a tiny firm. You know, they claim they are hackers who are making the world a better place, right? And this idea that uh, we can make a world a better place, uh, regardless of whatever price we'll pay for it later, and regardless of the political and social consequences of that quest, I think in itself um, has become one of the most dominant themes in contemporary ideology. I mean, you can look at politicians in America, in, in, you know, in Europe, you can look at somebody like Barack Obama, who to some extent, uh, even though he was clearly a much better um, president than Donald Trump, he also embodied this solutionist mindset to some extent. He was fascinated with not just technology, but technology as it is seen and made and done in Silicon Valley. You know, I think it was very symbolic that the very last big public act that Obama made before leaving office was becoming a guest editor of Wired magazine. You know, in Wired magazine, if it's not well known in, in, in Spain, is essentially the main publication of this you know, ideological movement that's been around for 30 years. And uh, the idea that somebody like the President of the United States can become an editor of a technology magazine, if only for one issue, to me it was a very significant uh, proof that this ideology is very widespread. The question that I think that we can address or discuss further is what is so harmful and dangerous about that, right? And I think this is where we really have to be very careful because very often these efforts to present problems as social and political problems as somehow amenable to be solved by technology, as being capable of being addressed by hackers, it conceals uh, a lot of hidden Latin processes of depoliticization, you know, the, the problems that have multiple ways to interpret them, problems that have multiple definitions. You know, you pick any issue, including issues like climate change, you know, including issues like, um, I don't know, domestic violence, you know, you name it. You will hear that, you know, we can all condemn it, we can all condemn climate change, domestic violence, you know, you name it, but there will be multiple perspectives on where these problems come from. You know, you might be blaming big industry, you might be blaming uh, corrupt politicians, you might be blaming lobbyists, you might be blaming something else by looking at one problem. And in the process of debating the causes, you might actually end up coming up with a solution that will be democratic, ambitious, strategic, and perhaps long-lasting. As we sidestep this focus on the causes and focus mostly on how we can mitigate the effects, which is the primary contribution of digital technologies. You know, that's what they are good for. They're very good at hiding or minimizing the negative impact of political and social processes over which we as citizens have no more any control. You know, so you can have you know, new emission standards in cars, mm -hmm. and you hope that you will control climate change that way, 
instead of actually going and addressing the root causes of the problem. Right? And I think that the universalization of that ideology, the idea that the proliferation of data, sensors, and algorithms, and other digital devices and artifacts in society at large, you know, including programs like the smart city, for example, here in Barcelona, the idea that the universalization of all these technologies at the planetary scale will allow us to tackle these effects even better and fix all the problems, at least as far as they harm us, on the output side and not on the input side. I think it's, it's ideology that is still quite dominant and prevalent. You know, of course, Donald Trump is not Barack Obama, and America is now undergoing a very different period, and Europe perhaps is also much less susceptible to many of these ideas that used to come from Silicon Valley. But nonetheless, I think this ideology that technology still is the way to create employment, even in Spain here, you hosted a very big conference in Madrid with your prime minister celebrating startups just a couple of weeks ago. So even here, if you look at very small manifestations of this, you will see that there is still this idea that technology, digital startups, encouraging hackers, encouraging people to go and solve things, it's the way to go. We'll think about what is broader impact on society later. And it's this reluctance to think about the broader consequences, I think, that I find troubling. Mm. Per tant, eh, d'alguna manera estem dient que aquest tecnosolucionisme el que ens fa és reduir les eh, oportunitats reals de solucionar els problemes, perquè d'alguna forma només estarem mesurant els problemes d'una forma determinada i només segurament intentarem resoldre aquelles qüestions que la tecnologia ens permeti mesurar, dit d'alguna manera. Well, uh, sure. I mean, it might be that in the process of solving some of these issues uh, through technology or apps or you know, finding a clever way to incentivize people to change their behavior, which is what most of the digital apps now are about, mm. will solve the problem temporarily. But you know, for me, as somebody who also thinks about politics and not just about technology, uh, it's also important to look for who uh, bears the burden of costs of solving them. You know, there are many ways to solve the problem of, you know, homelessness. You can just get rid of the homeless people, right? From the perspective of the homeless person, it's not a good solution to homelessness, <laughs> right? So uh, for me, the fact that we have technologies that can solve many different problems is not necessarily, uh, you know, it doesn't say anything about the politics of solutions. I'll give you one example of how I think this solutionist ideology uh, clearly affects how we think about problems. So in uh, Chicago, in America, I'm sorry, I will, I will give you ex European examples as we go on, but America really is the concentration <laughs> of that ideology in one country. Uh, so if you look at, uh, in Chicago, major city, you know, big urban center, there is uh, a new type of entity that now exists. It's a consulting firm, which is staffed mostly by academics with degrees in behavioral sciences. So they have a lot of Nobel Prize winners on the advisory board who have won Nobel Prizes for their contributions to behavioral economics. They have a lot of psychologists. They basically have a lot of people who spend all day looking at human behavior and finding ways in which we tend to behave irrationally and finding ways through various incentives, nudges, and other types of interventions to bring us back in what they perceive to be this rational mode of acting. Mm -hmm. So, and they try to now use these insights into behavior to solve real problems that might exist in the city, in the country, and elsewhere. So a startup, if you want to look it up, it's a consulting firm, it's called Ideas42. So um, they, I've, I've been reading an article about them, and one of the problems they're trying to tackle is the problem of uh, traffic in Chicago. And specifically the fact that their, and you know, it's a problem I see in Barcelona, especially as tourists arrive, their metro system is not made for so many people using it. That there are clearly far too many people, especially during specific rush hours, sports events, and so forth, that just over flood the metro system, and they clearly create a lot of problems, including security risks. 
Now, you clearly have a panoply of solutions to this problem. You can invest more money into infrastructure. You can build an additional metro line. You know, you can actually, I don't know, expand the one you already have by putting better, faster, larger trains in it. Uh, the premise of this startup, which works on these issues, is that all of these interventions are big macro level interventions that the public has no money for, has no political force to enact, and they will never probably take place in our lifetime. So what they would like to do instead is to manipulate the incentives and the behavior of individual users so that people who would take a train at six in the evening would wait for two more hours at work because they will get some voucher which will allow them to order food at a discount and they would take the train at eight, thus easing the burden on the train system. Mm -hmm. right? And it's a very trivial example, but the idea that so many problems now can be solved essentially by tinkering with the individual incentives that all of us as consumers clearly have and can react to, and the fact that all of that is happening as we stop acting at a bigger scale, which does involve things like political fights, massive investments, infrastructural expansion, and so forth, to me it's a very good example of the shrinking of the political imagination and the deployment of this perpetual you know, surveillance of our behavior and the linking of that surveillance of our behavior with a perpetual consumption machine, which wants us to essentially behave better and become better citizens, but to do that through integration into consumer capitalism and not some kind of alienation from it. So it's kind of a modern church, you know? If only you behave more rationally and consume better, you can actually achieve salvation and perhaps even solve problems like over congestion or climate change. Mm -hmm. Interessant, aquest exemple de, de Chicago que, que ens compartías. Si et sembla, m'agradaria ara... Sí, si et sembla, eh, podríem parlar ara d'un altre concepte que fas servir molt, que és sobre la conveniència. No? És a dir, ens estaves explicant el cas d'algú que li donen un, un cupó de descompte perquè s'esperi dues hores més a la feina. Però podríem estar parlant de eh, la quantitat d'aplicacions que fem servir al llarg del dia, que ens monitoritzen, que ens segueixen, que inclús ens fan recomanacions de quina hora hem de sortir de casa per arribar, per arribar a la feina en funció del trànsit que hi ha, etc. No? Com, com expliques aquest, aquest aquest mecanisme racional de la, de la conveniència. És a dir, sabem que ens estan espiant, per d'alguna manera, sabem que ens estan controlant, però tot i així ho fem servir a gust. Well, you know, I, I, I don't think of myself as a moralist in that, you know, I, when people are faced with this choice of, you know, free <laughs> incentives and goods, you know, I'm, I'm not the one to tell them you should live an austere life and renounce everything and walk to home instead of taking the metro. Uh, or, you know, get off Gmail or Google and go to the library and look up things in the newspaper catalog. Um, I think, you know, that's, that, to do that, and a lot of technology critics, you know, like myself, do give that moral advice to people, because ultimately, under conditions of shrunken political imagination and very little space left for actual politics, what else can you do? You can take this kind of moral prescriptions as a simulacrum of politics of some kind and just uh, guide people towards what you think will at least give them moral satisfaction and resistance and so forth. There are a lot of serious people who are saying that following actually, you know, Foucault, you can do a lot of work on yourself by cultivating this resistance to temptations. I mean, that's not necessarily just the idea of the church. Uh, you know, I. The cynical Eastern European part of me tells that you know you should just grab all those incentives and you know get all the coupons and make sure that these people lose as much money as they can on those free meals. Uh, but the more uh, serious part of me, of course, acknowledges that you know you can only beat the enemy if you have tools better than the enemy. Uh, and at this point, uh, we seem to be in a position where, if you really want to be an effective campaigner. And if you want to be an effective public person of some kind, 
uh, you cannot afford not to be on social media and you cannot afford not to be using Google, Gmail and um, all the other tools. Of course, I'm saying that with a lot of uh, you know, footnotes, with a lot of uh, conditions. I mean, clearly, if you are an activist in a dangerous country, you know, I wouldn't recommend people to be using Gmail in you know, Saudi Arabia to overthrow a government. Clearly, you need to do other things than campaigning. To do that, you need to do actual planning, and careful planning requires secrecy of absolute kind. Uh, but for people who are in it to highlight a cause, you know, to, to, to show that there is something in our current digital capitalism that's broken, you have two choices. You can be essentially rather invisible and refuse to use any of those platforms, in which case, you have clean conscience, but you are invisible as far as your targets are concerned. Uh, or you can have a compromised conscience, but at the same time have some visibility that might enact some change and actually push policymakers or the media or the politicians or the citizens uh, to wake up and take action. Uh, so uh, again, I, I wouldn't necessarily look at this issue just through the prism of convenience. Uh, there is also, I think, here something to do with opportunity, maybe, and, and the ability of, well, you know, the more technical term that you know, I'm sure you know as, as much as many of the people who work on technology here, affordance, right? It's the idea that you, you know, see a certain deployment of a particular tool or platform that might be in your interests or in your kind of within your strategic vision, and you do it. But it, it is true that. Uh, there are structural social factors which explain why so many of us run and flee to use uh, Gmail and, uh, you know, and, and, and all of these tools. And partly it has to do with the fact that ultimately they are free, they do not require us to pay any money up front. And uh, most people have such a blurry view of what the consequences of using them over the long term would be that it just never occurs to them that there is anything nefarious in it. And this is where I think that is only possible in a world where the kind of image, the, the picture of how this digital capitalism works and what its ultimate consequences would be is rather blurry. You know, and I think most people do not understand that every time they use G Google search or they use Gmail, they train the artificial uh, intelligence system that Google relies upon in one way or another to offer other services. You know, you might be thinking that you just want to get access to an academic paper and Google asks you to, you know, prove that you are human and you have to check five photos that have bridges on them and you might think that just a natural condition of exchange in this digital economy, but while you are teaching Google to recognize bridges, some program of Google or another firm that has that data then uses that knowledge to build an object recognition system that then operates drones that you know, decide which bridges to bomb in Yemen. You know, our ability to draw those connections and to understand that essentially, in addition to serving us all these fantastic goods and products, these firms have another business, and that business is selling services to governments, to the military, to banks, and to each other. Right? Uh, and that part of them is far more profitable in many cases than selling us or showing us ads. We don't see that part of the digital economy. We focus too much on consumption, and we focus too little on understanding how money in this economy actually is made. We don't know that all of the cloud of the Central Intelligence Agency, of the CIA, is run by Amazon. Most people think that Amazon is that great thing where you order you know, the diaper for your kid. You know, they don't think that it's actually the infrastructure for storing all of the data that CIA has amassed over the years. And it's in drawing those connections that I think most of our critiques and analysis of digital capitalism have failed to deliver a more comprehensive holistic picture.
I aleshores, com podem fer-ho perquè els ciutadans i les ciutadanes prenguem consciència de tot això que hi ha al darrere, més enllà de la fantàstica experiència d'usuari que tenim amb Amazon, amb Google o amb Gmail, i més enllà d'aquesta condició que no hi ha intercanvi econòmic que ens altera completament la percepció que estem pagant en espècies i en aquestes espècies finalment són les nostres dades, els nostres comportaments i els nostres patrons de conducta quan estem online. Well, uh, partly it, it has to do with, uh, again, the failure of even our traditional analytical frameworks, both the kind of orthodox neoclassical ones and even more radical leftist, ecological or Marxist ones to understand how value in the digital economy is generated, right? And I was hinting at it in my, in my previous answer, but I think we don't have anything resembling uh, you know, the, the theory of labor theory of value, but in the digital realm, right? And I think uh, it's without that, you are really trapped in a paradigm that assumes that all value in the system is generated through exchange, and that that exchange is voluntary, and people are actually aware of it, Maybe they do not realize it, but they probably clicked some button that granted the rights to their data to the big firms. And most people fail to draw the uh, normal conclusion that they are much more valuable and profitable and useful to the companies than the companies are to them, <laughs> right? And I think that's the uh, kind of aha moment that uh, is missing in the current debate. And you know, ultimately, once you enable to show people that there is far more value that's generated from their online activities, that is the share that they get in return as services, and that much of that value flows far away from their countries. It flows to other countries, not all of them democratic. Uh, I think people will hopefully pay closer attention. I will give you just one example, which especially this week I think will, will resonate quite well uh, with the news. Uh, one of the largest investors in Uber, you know, the company that you are familiar with, if only by its absence or occasional absence in Barcelona, is SoftBank, this uh, large Japanese fund. Actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a telecommunications company, but they have a fund which is now the largest pot of money which is invested in uh, digital technology of all kinds, robots, uh, co-working spaces, but also things like Airbnb and things like Uber, so mobility and um, transportation. Uh, so one of the main investors in that fund is not actually SoftBank, but various sovereign wealth funds of various governments. So Saudi Arabia is the largest investor in SoftBank, having given it anywhere in the range of 40 to $60 billion. Uh, so Uber essentially sits on a lot of Saudi money. Uh, think about how the Uber model works. So Uber right now is losing a lot of money virtually everywhere it operates, but especially in America, uh, because their long-term strategy is to become the number one provider in each of those countries where they operate and to essentially control the entire market, right? So they can afford to lose one billion a year in the United States, for example, because they know that ultimately they will be able to drive out all the taxi companies out of business because their pockets are much deeper than those of the local taxi companies. And I'm not defending local taxi companies, I'm just saying that the pockets of Saudi Arabia are much deeper than those of any local taxi operator. Now, at some point, having lost all those billions, you, as Uber, are faced with a choice. How do you return money to investors? You know, it's not a charity service for Saudi Arabia to subsidize taxi rides or transportation rides of people in America or Barcelona or anywhere else. So, of course, you have two choices. How do you actually return your money? And it's basically by raising prices so that once there is no more competition, you can actually charge higher fees for rights 
and that way you can recuperate some of the losses. Or option number two, you can essentially uh, automate the driving process, have a self-driving car or some other vehicle, carry people around, get rid of the drivers, and that way get rid of the main labor expense that you have carried so far in your expense sheet. Now, Uber has done everything to arrive towards the second vision because it will allow them to keep the prices as they are but get rid of the drivers and not having to pay labor. Mm -hmm. Think about it from the perspective of the local economy. So you pick an average town in Europe which had a taxi industry with a lot of problems. You know, nobody wants to defend them except, you know, in some places it works remarkably well. But still, they had problems. But they had drivers who would go out and spend money in the local economy. They would buy coffee, they would buy apartments, they would buy magazines, they would buy books. You actually had people who would go and create aggregate demand, so to say, locally. Once you replace that system with an automated car, whereby the artificial intelligence in it is in the hands of Uber, a company in California that pays virtually very little tax in Europe, the money that is made no longer stays here because there are no more drivers who are employed and who buy coffees and car and whatever magazines. All that money flows to Saudi Arabia as the main investor in Uber, and you essentially left with maybe affordable taxi rides, but far less in terms of employment and far less in terms of control over the key resource of the digital economy, which is artificial intelligence. I'm not here defending the idea that transportation should always be managed by humans. I'm here defending the idea that if you want to have full automation, and if that automation will be driven and done by artificial intelligence, and if some of that artificial intelligence is actually built with the data that we have provided to these firms, then we should be able to claim an ownership state in that artificial intelligence. And that way, if we do have a successful transportation system and it cuts costs and it makes a lot of money, I would rather to have that money stay locally in the local economy in Barcelona, Spain, Europe, rather than flow to rather untransparent sources whose only contribution to this innovation so far has been sitting on a lot of money generated from selling oil, with which, of course, they buy a lot of Spanish weapons also, but they also do a lot of things, including investing in a lot of firms, uh, which now are at the cutting edge of industry. Gracias para que esta para que dibuix clar, no, de, del, del potencial que tenen les dades per 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 disrompre eh, l'economia més enllà més enllà de la de la tecnologia, que això entronca també amb quin és el paper de les plataformes en en, en tot aquest eh, extractivisme de de dades. M'agradaria ara, hem, ens hem fixat en tota la part fosca, no? M'agradaria ara que nessim una miqueta a l'altra a l'altra banda, perquè tu has proposat en alguns casos solucions, perquè aquestes dades i perquè tot aquest eh, diguéssim tot aquest la batuta de la política eh, vinculada a l'economia de les dades no no recaigui a Silicon Valley, sinó que recaigui, per exemple, en centres de dades que tu anomenes socialitzats. No? Això em fa pensar en quin paper pot jugar l'administració pública per contraposar una mica aquesta balança de poder que ara mateix està absolutament descompensada, com, com comentaves. Well, let me preface that by saying that states and governments have choices in this new digital economy. Uh, some of them can just be passive free riders on the successful, disruptive innovators like Uber and Airbnb. You know, and again, they might be innovators in genuine services, they might be innovators in you know, extraction <laughs> of something. So uh, look at the government of Norway, right? A very clever government has understood that it sits on a lot of oil, that oil will eventually run out. They've created a sovereign wealth fund, which unlike that of Saudi Arabia, does not invest in new companies. They only invest in companies that are traded on the stock exchange. So you have the government of Norway essentially controlling major chunks of all the big technology firms, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, and so forth, and getting quite a lot of returns from those shares, and using those shares and those returns to plug the holes in the budget of the Norwegian welfare system. Right? 
it's an example of a country which has decided that instead of building its own robust domestic industry in response to the American one, like China has done, it would instead try to ride the tiger of global capitalism, so to say, and align the interests of its workers and recipients of its welfare with the interests of companies that might actually be exploiting workers in other countries. So basically, the fact that iPhones cost so little in China is very good news to the recipients of welfare in Norway because this is how their welfare checks partly are generated. They're generated by having very poorly paid labor conditions in China. That's how Apple manages to achieve such high uh, heights for its stock. Now, that's one option, one path for governments to go, not the path uh, that I'm advocating. I think that uh, governments, and here you know, we really have to problematize the question of Europe uh, as the kind of main uh, background condition of this debate, at least on this continent, because virtually all European states have failed to generate anything comparable to what the Americans and the Chinese have generated. You know, if we were having this debate 10 years ago, China would not yet be so visibly present on the scene, and we would just be saying that it's all due to American innovative culture of entrepreneurship and uh, libertarianism, and you could not have it anywhere else. You really need to be in California and, you know, and be wearing this hoodies and the sweaties and whatever else they're wearing and drinking, you know, yogurts. And <laughs> that's the only way to and carrying, you know, yoga mats with you everywhere you go. And that's the way to build the next great American startup. China, in the last 10 years, you know, we can talk about the excesses of its authoritarian model and what it means for human rights, and there is, you know, no good news on that front, but they have managed to build an alternative, right? And if you're looking at that story from the vantage point of Europe, you clearly see that something has failed here because ultimately Europe has nothing to boast of when it comes to artificial intelligence. When it comes to you know autonomous cars, uh, when it comes to most of the big technologies that are now shaping not just the digital part of the economy but reshaping the economy at large, and here clearly what's missing is a big push, right? And the usual answer in the European circles has been that we need a European Google of some kind. I have argued against that idea for many years, uh, in part because I think. We do not need a Google to compete with Google. We need an alternative model of organizing digital economy where the most precious resource is not owned by private players. So I would like to think of data as some kind of social infrastructure on which other services and other parts of the new welfare in this digital model can be built and offered. Uh, and uh, then find ways in a very uh, swift and decentralized manner of encouraging uh, local players, uh, entrepreneurs, local associations, and, you know, anybody with a good idea to build applications that would put that data to good use in the common interest. Once you have basic control over that data layer of that infrastructure, you can actually specify the conditions on which different local and international players will be able to access that data. Just like we can specify conditions of who pays and who doesn't pay when they get onto a highway you know, in, 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 in Europe. There are different rates, occasionally in Germany. You know, if you are German, you have a German number plate, you might be paying less than if you are you know, coming from Austria on a German highway. Right? We can debate whether it's a good system to facilitate freedom of movement in Europe, but ultimately, once you have basic control over infrastructure, you can have this differentiated access right? conditions. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to see is a system where if I am a clever social activist in Barcelona, and I would like to build some kind of a service that will serve my neighborhood here, may be something very banal like a weather forecast, or it may be something much more useful like a, some kind of a bulletin board where we will be planning some kind of neighborhood activity or a cleanup or you name it. 
I would like to have better conditions of access to that data about my neighbors than a foreign company like Google or some company from China. Google is welcome to come and try to do something with that data if they're willing to pay a fee. Right? While me, as a local developer, representing the interests of my neighbors, I would actually receive some kind of a grant or a stipend or an encouragement from my local city council, from my municipality, to work in that direction. To me, it seems like an extremely reasonable system which works much better than the centralized Google model, where essentially Google is the company having amassed all that data which has to decide on what fronts it would like to innovate. Right? Google claims that the access to innovation has been democratized, but in fact, it's only Google who's working on all the big issues, life extension, uh, space colonization, uh, you know, s autonomous cars, all of those issues have been identified by Google as of some priority to its founders. It's their prerogative. But they're using the data that all of us have generated to work towards those goals. What I would like to have is a system where the data that we commonly generate stays in the public hands, and we can then, with some intermediation by public authorities at the city level, at the regional level, at the national level, at the European level, find ways to encourage different groups and social actors to actually do something useful with that infrastructure. Which, of course, will not solve all of the problems. You will not build an alternative to China's artificial intelligence strategy, which will spend $130 billion in the next 12 years to develop artificial intelligence just at the level of central government not counting municipalities, not counting regions, not counting private capital. Just the central government of China will spend $130 billion on developing artificial intelligence in China. Right? Uh, you cannot do it by pulling the resources of you know, Barcelona, Girona, and uh, a few other cities. Even if you put many of the big European cities, it will be very hard to pull it off. So it requires systematic, centralized approach, but without doing the more interesting democratic bit, with the data, that AI will not serve the function that it should be serving. Mm -hmm. Ara que mencionas el, el cas xinès, se m'acut també que hem vist la cara diabòlica de la part privada, però justament a Xina una de les coses que estan fent és, és construir un, el que se li diu un sistema de crèdit social, on realment estaran, diguéssim, ja ho han començat a, a desenvolupar, on cada ciutadà tindrà una nota Uh, un número, estarà associat a un número on aquest, aquest número estarà nodrit per el seu comportament afí al règim, per el, diguéssim, el seu, la seva trajectòria professional, però també alguns dels seus hàbits de consum, de moviment, no? qualsevol de les coses que, que actualment el nostre mòbil pot, pot eh, fer seguiment de manera fàcil. No? Com, com podríem contrarrestar això també? És a dir, que tu mencionaves no? el, el fer servir les dades com, com un bé comú, com un recurs de bé comú i amb un propòsit de bé comú. Veiem també que a nivell Estat també se'n pot fer un, un mal ús d'això i convertir-ho en un aliat de la dictadura. Com podem lidiar-ho? Well, You know, I think there is a lot of justified concern and anxiety about the social credit system in China in, in our own democracies, and I get that, but there is clearly not enough concern in our own backyard about our own systems of rankings and reputation uh, that have sprung up in the last uh, few years. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. So Facebook, as of a few months ago, assigns some of its users, and we don't know how many, it could be all of us, could be 40% of us, could be 80% of us, but I would venture that most of us get a rating of some kind, which depends on who our friends are, what kind of information we post on the site, uh, how credible we seem, how likely we to resemble some kind of a Russian bot or an algorithm that might just be posting something fake, and based on that score, we, Facebook then decides and creates conditions of visibility for everything we post. So if Facebook suspects that we are some kind of a fake account, because our friends are not trustworthy, I only have 50 friends, well, everybody has 500, Facebook does not remove me, does not ban me, but it makes me almost invisible on the platform. 
So while I have this uh, belief that I keep posting these marvelous posts about the, you know, my family and the politics and how everybody is uh, so angry and Donald Trump is uh, not good and, you know, and, and nobody sees it, <laughs> right? Because ultimately Facebook has decided that I'm a danger to the ecosystem. Uh, Apple has started doing something very similar, assigning rankings also to its own users. And Uber does it for a very long time. So passengers are ranked and drivers are ranked, uh, but the, the real innovation in this sphere has been the introduction of uh, a new requirement in Australia and New Zealand where passengers whose rating drops below four can no longer use the app of Uber. So essentially, if you have ridden in an Uber taxi and for some reason the drivers did not like you very much uh, and you get a rating lower than four out of five, you are banned from using Uber, right? So you cannot use it. And to me, uh, we, our future in democracies will be increasingly shaped by this dynamic of private ratings and private rankings and this fear, and this, not sphere, but fear, this fright, you know, this mm -hmm. uh, concern uh, about uh, the centralized solution in China, uh, where, you know, the government just decided that instead of letting every single company do that, they'd like to have a single centralized approach, uh, which, you know, given the current Chinese system, we might all dislike and say it's bad, but if I were to think about it from the perspective of democratic rights, I would clearly rather prefer to have a public alternative and a public equivalent to this rating system, which instead of rating us about everything, would actually just provide a minimum number of uh, identifiers which will be enough for the transaction to proceed you know and it's a very simple transaction you know if I come to a bar where there is a requirement a legal drinking age requirement you know I have to be older than 16 to order alcohol you know the bar does not need to know my real age they only need to know that I'm above that age right and you can think of a digital identity system, ecosystem, and some countries actually moving in that direction, which will kind of aggregate those attributes, which will then be easy to access by Uber, Airbnb, and the rest of them, and which will essentially give them just enough data to engage in the transaction with us, but will not allow them to go on down the path of these private ratings and essentially private governance. Because this is what the other equivalent is. You know, that's a system where what we used to take to be rights, you know, I have a right, I think, to freedom of expression, I have a right to you know, move around, I have a right to a lot of things, you know, those are all rights written in our constitution. Uh, in the digital realm, we have none of that. We like to talk about digital rights, but what we have in reality for the most majority of us are digital permissions, digital concessions. And those are essentially privileges granted to us by a handful of firms, which they have granted to us because they needed something from us. And in this case, it has been data. At some point, once they no longer need us, or they think that we are a Russian bot, or they think that there is something fishy in our phone, or they think that you know, we make bad jokes when we ride a taxi, they ban us from their systems, and boom, you know, what we took to be rights disappear right so for me uh, it, it's clearly an issue and uh, however much we dislike the Chinese system uh, it still at least imagines a centralized state driven equivalent alternative mm -hmm. to the fully privatized system of private governance you know and again uh, I just think we, we have to be a bit realistic and we also have to be a bit honest about ourselves uh, you know, our own society is not the pinnacle of democracy and emancipation that we often hold it to be. Uh, and I think it's just, you know, in 2018, this constant uh, looking down on <laughs> the Chinese, it's just, I think, you know, it's the Chinese now who <laughs> represent the greatest resistance to Donald Trump. It's not the Europeans, I'm afraid. And Europeans are kind of very worried about losing the ability to sell cars. You know, uh, it's, not, it's not the kind of great moral composure 
that uh, you know represents the values of liberty, fraternity, and justice. You know, it, it's not that. So again, we should not adopt the Chinese model, but we should not also dismiss it as outright authoritarian just because all our own systems are so much more better and democratic. Just the fact, just because they are not centralized, does not mean that they are democratic, right? And I think that's what we often forget when we look at Facebook, Apple, and, and the rest of them. Mm. Sí, ha quedat, ha quedat clar que alguna cosa eh, hem de revisar també de, de les creences del que tenim aquí. Um, en alguna ocasió has escrit sobre el rol de les ciutats uh, en tot això per, com a espai de, de solució i de, i de, diguéssim, de desenvolupament d'un sistema diferent en quant a la sobirania de la informació, sobirania de les dades, en contraposició a aquesta globalització eh, polaritzada. No? Llavors, ara m'agradaria preguntar-te com, com una resposta com des de la resposta local, des de les ciutats intel·ligents amb ciutadans intel·ligents, podem crear un escenari que no sigui ni el capitalisme de Silicon Valley ni, ni la proposta xinesa de, de monitorització. Well, uh, again, I, say, I hope I made it clear that you know, my vision for social and political organization does involve uh, empowering citizens and delegating more and more tasks to citizens who increasingly become capable of uh, far greater autonomy, but also far greater things armed with technologies and armed with data. You know, I, I passionately believe in that. I think it's obvious to anybody who has ever used even a mobile phone that there are immense capacities and abilities hidden inside it that genuinely liberate time, that genuinely allow us to build new relationships, that genuinely allow us to stay in touch. Uh, I'm all for that. And I think that the kind of old centralized Bismarckian uh, bureaucratic system, which was very rigid and was very authoritarian, and the assumption was that you know, people are stupid and incapable of doing anything, and you need to have this benevolent dictator enshrined in some bureaucratic office that will decide everything for them. I think those times are gone, and I hope they are gone. Uh, which, of course, does not mean that we should just uh, move in and replace all of those bureaucrats with the instruments of the market, you know, far from it. Uh, uh, but we should do our best to find other actors that might step in and facilitate this devolution of power to people, right? Uh, so in that sense, cities uh, can clearly play a role, uh, but so far they haven't. You know, and so far they haven't, in, 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 I, I, would, I would say in my, again, critical opinion, I know Barcelona is a very nice counterexample to, to what I'm saying, but for the most part, they haven't. And, and they haven't in, in part because cities are deeply integrated into how global capitalism now works. They integrated the level of technology, they integrated the level of finance, they integrated the level of tourism, they, they integrated the level of infrastructure. And, uh, you can have a revolution that is meaningful in a city and it just will not last and it will not have the impact that you hope for without having a reasonable strategy about how you're going to deal with all of those four or three components I have mentioned, you know, from technology to finance. And there, you really need the power of the nation state and you need the power, in the case of Europe, of the actual European project to be able to articulate any vision that will uh, help you move forward. You know, and again, I'll just give you, maybe I'll, I'll bring it down to a more uh, kind of practical down to earth level. You know, I understand that much of the kind of positive uh, urban project in Western Europe, in Spain and Barcelona, but also in the United Kingdom, since the 19th century, has focused on things like remunicipalization. You know, we really need to take control of the infrastructures, have those infrastructures provided by collective social entities, and make sure that that way, you know, citizens are not exploited uh, in the purchase of those services, and that they actually have some uh, leeway and they have some power and leverage uh, over the infrastructures that shape their lives. You know, so the project of remunicipalization, and you know the story very well in Barcelona, the remunicipalization of energy, but of everything, you know, funeral bureaus and whatnot, it's quite strong and prevalent. The problem is that that model is somewhat hard to apply to the kind of things I've been discussing at the beginning, in part because the digital infrastructure that shapes our life has no physical, has almost no physical presence locally. 
there is no big server room which you can take over and remunicipalize it and say that from now on, you know, the traffic directions you get on your phone will be coming from the city hall and will not be coming from Google. Right? It's just not there. It, it just, but to me, it seems kind of bizarre that now Google, if you search for restaurants, uh, it basically, or any you know, gym, you can search for gyms in Barcelona, and it will tell you not only the average times when they're busy, so it will show you at 9 o'clock, it's very busy. At 11 o'clock, it's less busy. At 3 o'clock, it's not busy at all. It will show you real-time information about how busy venues, gyms, cafes, libraries, museums are, and it's information that does not come from the natural supplier of that information, which should be the city hall, because it operates a sensor infrastructure much greater in many respects than that of Google, but it comes from a company in California that has no ties whatsoever, for the most part, to any of those venues. So how do you remunicipalize that? Because clearly it helps us live our lives and it helps to navigate our lives, but it has these long-term consequences I discussed at the beginning. And I think that this is where without having a project and a global project for reshaping, remaking, reinventing, revolutionizing, whatever you want to say, it, global capitalism as it exists now, rooted in technology, rooted in finance, rooted in things like tourism, cities will find themselves only on the reactive side. You know, we can limit something here, we can ban Uber here, we can uh, kick Airbnb out of here, we can do this, this, and this, but this is very reactive. There is no proactive, aggressive project that seeks to actually challenge not just individual companies, but the logic that brings them together. And this is where, you know, as much as I endorse and encourage and celebrate this uh, fascination with cities and urbanism and urbanization, I, I think this movement also has to be quite uh, honest with itself. It, for the most part, except for calling for greater international alliances and opening up cities to migrants and showing more cosmopolitan side to what cities are, this municipal urban movement across the globe has yet to articulate what its strategy for this global project of transforming current capitalism is or should be. And without that vision, I think it's doomed to fail. And it might be a failure from which we learn quite a lot, but without having that project, you know, I, I don't hold my breath that uh, it will be as meaningful and impactful as many people expect it to be. Which, you know, is not necessarily common in Barcelona, which does quite a lot of things well. <laughs> Sí, sabem que, que l'Ajuntament de Barcelona està eh, creant alguns pilots al voltant de la sobirania de les dades, um, però ara m'agradaria baixar-ho al terreny individual. No? Nosaltres, com a ciutadans conscients que estem aquí aquesta tarda reflexionant sobre això, quin consell ens donaries com a ciutadans? Què, què, què hem de fer davant d'això mentre esperem que eh, puguem remunicipalitzar algun dia des de, des de l'Ajuntament i que, que els estats i que, i que òrgans superiors eh, s'alineïn i que facin aliances internacionals on, on les dades siguin realment aquest bé comú? Com a ciutadans, què podem fer? Quina crida podem fer? On podem fer pressió? Bueno, well, I, I think, you know, uh, I, I do a lot of events in, in many different countries and, you know, my impression is that in virtually most of them, the, 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 the largest obstacle in the path towards transformation is our inability to grasp how the system operates at large. Uh, and, you know, and then again, it brings us back to some of the early themes of this conversation we've had this evening, but it's very hard for people, let alone young people who are supposed to be active users of these technologies, to understand all the interconnections that exist between finance and technology, data and artificial intelligence, our use of something very banal to prove that we are not human, and the use of drones in the Middle East. Those are very complex issues, and we are not here talking about digital literacy of some kind. You know, we're talking here about societal literacy, which uh, you know, should explain to people how things genuinely work in the economy at large. Uh, and this is where, without education, and without more emphasis on you know, grasping and visualizing this beast, if you will, uh, I think we are not going to have any transformation whatsoever. In part because 
<clears throat> for, and, but, and you have seen it, that you know, it's not enough to continue on the path on which we have been for the last 15 years, which has been the path mostly of framing everything as a question of privacy. Right? So uh, if you frame every single technology or digital problem as a problem of privacy, which I am afraid was the kind of result of even of Edward Snowden revelations, then you end up in a society which thinks quite well about what kinds of data are accessed and what kinds of data are not accessed and by whom and on what conditions and it becomes very legalistic. It becomes almost you know, a full employment scheme for lawyers, uh, which you know, might be good for lawyers, but it does not really tell you anything about what powers and forces are out there, except for maybe security services, which are extracting all the data revealed by Snowden. It tells you nothing about sovereign wealth funds that are investing in, this, in all of these businesses. It doesn't tell you anything about the reasons why they're doing it. It doesn't tell you anything about where the money come from. It doesn't make any connections to the last 10 years that we have lived since the financial crisis, which have profoundly shaped the technological environment in ways in which we barely understand because for most people, yes, on the one hand, there is the financial crisis and its impact, you know, people losing houses, uh, political parties being formed to contest that, and so forth. That's on the one side. On the other side, there is this positive story, Uber, Airbnb, and the rest of it. But it's not so clear cut. I mean, the reason why Uber and Airbnb managed to get all this money is because all these companies like SoftBank and some sovereign wealth funds can borrow money very cheaply on the international markets. And the reason why they can borrow so cheaply on the international markets is because of the financial crisis, the entire global economy still operates in a low interest rate environment. Right? So I can make those connections, having spent quite a lot of years studying both finance and economics and technology. For most people, this is like talking about organic chemistry. You know, it's very hard to make those connections together. And I think this is where we need more interdisciplinary thinking. Uh, and this is where, you know, I think uh, citizens as such, I mean, have to be able, with the help of institutions, hopefully, that will guide them or push them or somehow enlighten them about that, they should be able to uh, achieve at least some understanding that if we're really worried about big themes, you know, exploitation, justice, fairness, we have to understand how it's done by the companies that now are the largest companies in the world by market capitalization. You know, it's not oil firms, it's not banks. Those are technology firms in the United States and in China. And if we claim to have some understanding of how the economy works, but we do not understand the very core of it, then our analysis of all those things, including exploitation, you know, the fairness of exchange, all of that is good for nothing. And if all of that is good for nothing, what are our political parties doing? Because our political parties, to some extent, are supposed to take ideological positions on these matters. And this is where I think citizens just need to demand more of the political representatives, at the level of the party, of you know, trade unions, you name it, in trying to grapple with these issues. Because it's obvious that Europe, which had so much potential in this field, and had some landmark companies. You know, Europe had Nokia at some point, which was number one in phones. Mm -hmm. It had Olivetti much earlier, which was number one in computers. All of that now is virtually gone. And the politicians, instead of coming up with a good, reasonable, strategic analysis of what to do and where we are, they prefer to take the easy path and just celebrate startups. Because if you celebrate startups, the assumption is that capital will come in and everything will be good. But the kind of capital that these tiny startups attract is not the capital that is attracted by Uber and Airbnb. You know, you're talking about capital on the scale of $100 billion flowing to those companies and capital on the scale of $100 million coming to those startups. Right? And so again, politics has to be brought back onto the landscape and international politics has to be brought back onto the landscape. And this is where you know, most of the discussions of the technology in the public debate are badly, badly lacking. Because all of that is still presented as very apolitical, 
having no geopolitical contacts, completely unrelated to the financial crisis. All of that happens because Mark Zuckerberg goes to his garage and invents something and then it becomes a big thing. There is no Pentagon in the story, there is no Wall Street, there are no financial backers, there is no US trade policy making it easier to extract that data. All of that disappears and it just becomes a story about you know, the next Steve Job inventing the next Apple having taken too much LSD in his college days. You know? And that's more or less how the technology narrative still works. And you as readers, as you know, people who consume intellectual content of some kind, you just have to demand respect. I mean, those are fairy tales which are presented to us as accurate representations of the world. You know, just now we are studying the Greek myth. You know, in a hundred years time, uh, maybe the successors of ours will be studying our stories of technology entrepreneurs. Uh, for this mythical content, because they really reflect mythical content and very little else. Sí, aleshores, eh, ens fa una crida, eh, ens fas una crida a, a més educació, a prendre més consciència i d'alguna manera recuperar la política en aquest, en aquest terreny. Um, estem ja bastant avançats en la conversa, però no voldria tancar sense preguntar-te, eh, perquè al mes de maig va entrar en vigor, ple vigor, la, la Llei Europea de Protecció de Dades. Diríem que és una, un marc legal que retorna d'alguna manera la sobirania de les dades als, als individus i, i fa entendre que les dades no són de qui les recull, sinó que les dades són de, de qui emet aquesta, aquesta informació. Ets optimista amb la llei eh, europea de protecció de dades? Well, it has certain positive aspects uh, and you know, I, I don't want to down great them. I mean, you have the ability to impose very large fines on companies that don't comply. And, you know, if just for that, I would just go and start finding these big firms on a daily basis. And I think now we will see more of that uh, in, in the years to come. Um, the slight discomfort that I have with GDPR is uh, twofold. One is that it really divides all data that we generate into essentially two types. One is the data that is not personal and that can be shared and the European Commission clearly wants to create a market in that data of some kind so that data flows and insurance companies, whoever else wants to get it, can get it. So it will be a liquid market in it. And uh, the second type of data is personal data, right? It's data that I own and I control it and that's it. I think it's a very... Um, I don't want to say simplistic, but it's not an ideological conception of reality that I recognize as my own. In that I also recognize the existence of groups, I recognize the existence of social units, I recognize the existence of larger social organizations who might claim a social right in certain types of data. You know, the data that is produced as I walk down uh, you know, the street in Barcelona, which is recorded by means of sensors paid for by the city hall and I walk on the pavement paid for by taxes and how, how on earth can I claim that that data is mine? And how on earth can I claim that that data belongs to anybody who can grab it because it's non-personal? So clearly we need to be able to articulate more types of data which will also allow to bring more actors to the table and think about models that do not limit themselves just to this you know, it's really the individual bourgeois subject of 19th century law, you know, whose privacy we need to protect, so we'll give them some rights, and that individual bourgeois subject will go and, you know, vote, hopefully, and use that privacy to be good, but not too good, because he might get too radical. Right? So, I mean, to me, it's a very old-fashioned conception of reality. But the second point about GDPR is that uh, it's not what's in it. It's the way by which it tries to grapple with problems and with reality, right? And I think that it kind of reflects this rather passive attitude on behalf of the European Commission, uh, which is about relying on law, in particular on regulation, as a way to uh, restitute some damages, you know, from the digital economy that they can no longer shape. Right, so essentially, you know, it's the same as antitrust. You know, who is now the leading enforcer of antitrust in, in the world? It's the European Commission. So, I mean, it, it's, there is nothing wrong in it per se, but it, it gives uh, this false illusion and impression that Europe is the avant-garde 
Uh, and the question then you should be asking, well, if you are so much in the avant-garde, how come all the big tech companies are in China and the United States? Right? So, and, and that, of course, you can invent many different responses to this and say that, no, we don't like monopolies, we like privacy, so it's impossible to create a big company here. But I think it's just not an answer that you can give in a kind of real politic global economy. I mean, if you really believe that, that you know, we are so good and that's why we are so weak, then the main part of the sentence is that we are very weak. <laughs> You know, I approach it with a very kind of Kissingerian, you know, mindset, unfortunately. Because ultimately, if you end up in a situation where your main industry, which in Europe is still selling cars, including cars made here, you know, in Seat, which are mostly, you know, German cars, or used to be German cars, you know, those are the cars that we import, export. Uh, the problem that we have is that once you move to either electric vehicles, in which Europe has no capacity whatsoever to produce batteries and has to depend on batteries coming from South Korea or China, or if you move at the artificial intelligence that will guide those cars, or operating systems that will operate them, in none of those Europe has a lead over the Chinese or the Americans, then you end up in a situation where even your most prosperous part of the economy becomes hostage. Just like Uber now, you know, becomes hostage to the whims of the Saudi regime and, you know, you essentially have to live with the fact that whatever these people do to their dissidents and journalists, Uber has taken quite a lot of billions from them. It's a weakness, and for me, the fact that Europe will be in a position of weakness, it's not good news, right? And again, I, I think we have to be able to think bigger, we have to think beyond antitrust, and we have to think beyond privacy in order to understand what is it that we can do to build our own, if not domestic giants that can match uh, you know, Americans or the Chinese, but to at least have some autonomy in the pursuit of our own economic and political objectives. Because if you lose control of that, you know, you essentially, you know, I'm sorry, it might seem odd also to be talking about these things in Spain, but I think, you know, we are kind of facing a threat of colonization by technology, just that at this particular juncture, Europe will not be the colonizer, but will be the colonized. Because ultimately, if you lose control of the most advanced sector of your economy, and if it's controlled by such jingoistic players as Donald Trump or Xi Jinping in China at this point, what are you going to do? I mean, it's not a very advantageous position to be in. That's why, you know, it's not a critique of GDPR. It's a critique of the type of approach to problem solving that Europe likes to pride itself on well, in fact, in the long term, it might not necessarily be giving it the kind of advantages it hopes to get. That's, again, they, and I'm saying it as a very big believer and a sympathizer to the European project, just that given the current geopolitical developments, it does not seem to be enough to be pursuing this extremely technocratic legalistic interventions. There needs to be something else, and unfortunately, this is where my faith in the European project somewhat subsides, in that I don't think that the current political class is even capable of articulating what those solutions might be or should be and then defending them to the public and to the markets. But that's a story we can save maybe for a later debate. Probablement sí, perquè podríem estar-nos moltes hores amb aquest debat. La última pregunta que et voldria fer avui té a veure amb el llibre que tot just ara estàs escrivint, si no m'equivoco és el teu tercer. Ens podries regalar alguna de les idees que estàs treballant ara mateix en aquest llibre que de moment té un títol provisional de La llibertat com a servei? Well, the initial premise or the thesis that I started working on was that there was something very strange about the current moment in our political and geopolitical environment. And my initial hunch was that we might be experiencing something of a return to the dynamics that were more characteristic of the feudal era, where you know, power, private power was essentially unrestrained. Uh, the state, as much as it existed, did not really play any role of guaranteeing rights or political representation. And much of our daily life, unless we happen to be, you know, feudal lords, was rather precarious and we were living at the mercy of these private powers. 
uh, having explored that terrain for quite a while, uh, I have kind of abandoned this uh, framing of feudalism in part because I think that to speak so badly of feudalism now is to speak very highly of capitalism. <laughs> Uh, because essentially any accusation of something being feudal is an accusation of, not, of it not being capitalist. And uh, you know, if you think very hard uh, about the current environment, I just think that virtually everything we see now, including the privatization of public power, including its usurpation by uh, you know, big private firms, including the kind of double role that a lot of political classes are, 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 are making being uh, present in both the political sector and the business one, but also the fact that you know, we are at the mercy of big tech. We're at the mercy of what Facebook decides to do with our reputation rating. We're at the mercy of Uber allowing or not allowing us to ride in a car. I think to some extent it perfectly coheres and perfectly fits into a vision of capitalism where all of the services, including services of protection, defense, and lawmaking, are entirely privatized. You know, and there are quite a lot of people on the extreme libertarian right some of them perhaps even present in Spain, who would advocate that vision, who would really insist on the idea that the best type of law you can get is private law, it's law, it's contract law, it's you know, contract strike between individuals. It's not law imposed by the constitution or some kind of you know, central legislative body. Uh, and they would insist that the best type of you know, insurance is insurance offered by the private players and the best type of you know, firefighting existence or security is offered by private mercenaries and not a publicly working police. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of working in that direction, but the reason why the book is called Freedom as a Service partly has to do with the fact that it's an actual product I found from Cisco that was called like that. So, you know, Cisco, the big technology firm, uh, was actually working on a digital identity solution for refugees called Freedom as a Service. Because, you know, now if you follow the technology field a little bit, you would see that because of this cloud model, everything now is offered as a service. You know, so you get uh, software as a service, you get mobility as a service, you get you know, happiness as a service, everything becomes offered as a service, but what it really means is that you have no control over the underlying infrastructure that provides it because that infrastructure is controlled by someone else, right? So Amazon will offer you books as a service, but what it means is that you can wake up on every given morning and start your Kindle, your e-reader, and all of your books will disappear, or one of your books will disappear because Apple has decided, Amazon has decided that, you know, you have violated some rule and condition and boom. So even reading becomes a, becomes a service. So for me, you know, having thought about many of these issues for a while, it, it became obvious that this title, this term, freedom as a service, is more than just the name of a product that a technology company was working on. It's really the kind of overlying and overarching uh, vision for what life in this new environment would be. It's, it's, it's an environment where a lot of big technology firms, together with big financial firms, become the de facto equivalent or alternative to what we used to take to be the you know, civil state and welfare state. And they're the ones who do most of the lawmaking. And they're the ones who provide most of what we used to take to be welfare services, from education to health to transportation to you name it. And it's a quite scary future, but it's a future that I think is much faster than we think. Uh, and you already see some of it happening uh, under different names. You, know, you might not call it uh, freedom as a service, you might call it you know, the smart city, but the underlying paradigm in many places is the same, that you have this privately owned infrastructure with a couple of very hard to account for and unaccountable technology firms, and your well-being and your access to services depends on what they think about you. It does not depend on your constitutionally enshrined right to transportation or education <coughs> or something else. And for me, the overall kind of gestalt switch of society towards that model, it's uh, quite terrifying 
but it's also something that I think we rush too much to uh, describe as an aberration and deviation from the logic of capitalism. Uh, and I think it's much better to be understood as the almost normal development in the wake of the end of the Cold War. And there is a big kind of historical argument I'm also making in the book about you know, many other things, but I think we should not underestimate the current historical juncture. You know, 20 years since the end of the Cold War, more or less, 10 years since the financial crisis, and those are not trivial timelines, right? And a lot of things have happened, and a lot of material things have happened, but I think a lot of our assumptions about the world, about democracy, about capitalism, they have not changed. This is why to so many people, it's been such a revelation in the last few years that, oh, capitalism might not actually be for democracy, and that you might actually have authoritarian regimes that will be very good capitalists. You know, for a lot of people, it came as a surprise, but I would argue it came as a surprise only because the initial assumptions uh, were really profoundly shaped by their experiences or, or either of the Cold War or the experiences in that immediate aftermath. But you know, that would require, again, three hours for me to lay out <laughs> this <laughs> argument in detail. <laughs> Sí, clarament. Eh, crec que esperarem, el, esperarem a que surti el llibre perquè segur que ens dones una visió original i diferent, com a mínim amb aquesta perspectiva històrica on sembla que la tecnologia és una punta de l'iceberg, però en realitat tot el que està en joc és el contracte social que, que teixim al voltant de com, com volem eh, relacionar-nos els uns amb els altres, en l'entorn privat, a, a les administracions públiques i, i, en, i en el nostre dia a dia al final. Um, jo crec que ho podem deixar aquí. Moltíssimes gràcies, Eugeni, per, per haver vingut. Moltíssimes gràcies a tots per haver estat aquí. Espero que hagi resultat interessant. Eh, us podeu imaginar que tenia una llista de preguntes que han quedat eh, al tinter, o sigui que esperem que hi hagi una altra ocasió per seguir-les preguntant. Gràcies. Gràcies.